Today we're plunging into a story that honestly sounds like it's ripped straight from a Hollywood script. It's about the shocking, um, unprecedented comeback of a legendary military aircraft. Yeah, it's quite something. Imagine this, a fighter jet so advanced, you could argue it was decades ahead of its time, yeah. yet it gets passed over for its rival, just relegated oh. to the history books, you know, yeah. the big what if of aviation. A ghost, really, for <laughs> years, just whispers among enthusiasts about lost potential. Exactly. But now, this very aircraft isn't just back. It's being positioned to fundamentally redefine American air power. Strategy two in the 21st century. We're talking about the Northrop YF-23, the Black Widow II. Indeed. And you might think you know the story of the Advanced Tactical Fighter Competition, the ATF. But what's just been revealed, well, it changes the entire narrative. How so? Well, if a recently updated design concept is anything to go by, the YF-23 isn't just making some nostalgic return, it's actually being pitched as the U.S. Navy's FAXX, their sixth-generation fighter. Wow. So not just history repeating them. No, not at all. This is a strategic pivot, a really bold move that could reshape how the U.S. projects power globally, especially in the uh, most contested regions. Reshape global power. Okay, that's a monumental claim. Yeah. But I mean, how? How could an aircraft design from the 90s possibly be the answer today with all the complex challenges we face? Right. And if it really was so visionary back then, why on earth was it rejected in the first place? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? It is. And that's what we need to unpack. So today, we're going to pull back the curtain on this incredible saga. We'll get into the untold story of its original, frankly, groundbreaking design. We'll dive into the, let's say, contentious reasons it lost out. Mm -hmm. And critically, Examine how these terrifying new global threats have suddenly made its unique, once-dismissed capabilities absolutely essential, like non-negotiable. It's a fascinating turn of events. So get ready for a deep dive. It'll take you from the high-stakes Cold War skies of the 80s right to the contested waters of the modern Indo-Pacific. It's a journey that shows how a maybe misunderstood prophecy is finally getting its second act. But first, the central mystery we absolutely need to unravel. What exactly made this aircraft so revolutionary? Why is its potential return sending shockwaves now? And what critical capabilities did it have that its rival, the winner, just couldn't match? Stay with us because the answers, well, they won't just surprise you. They might just illuminate a powerful lesson about foresight, politics, and uh, technological necessity. Do you want to put it better? Okay, so let's unpack this fascinating history. To really grasp the significance of this potential YF-23 comeback, we have to rewind. Back to the early 1980s, the Advanced Tactical Fighter Program, ATF. Right. This was America's urgent response. The Soviets were rolling out formidable new aircraft, the Su-27 Flanker, the MiG-29 Fulcrum. These were seriously challenging Western air superiority at the time. So the goal for ATF was big. Huge. Nothing less than a generational leap. A quantum jump in air combat capability, really, to maintain dominance. And Northrop's approach with the YF-23, the Black Widow II, it was... Oh, yeah. different. Completely different. What's truly remarkable is their design philosophy. It was radically forward thinking. They focus intensely on three core things, all intertwined, true, all aspects stealth, not just head on, sustained supersonic crew, super coups without needing gas guzzling afterburners and significantly extended range. OK, so not just faster and stealthier, but built for a different kind of fight. Exactly. It wasn't just about making a better dogfighter. It was a deliberate you know, visionary choice. They optimized for beyond visual range combat, BVR. They were basically anticipating a future where fights would be decided long before pilots even saw each other. Sensors, long range missiles, that was the game they were playing. So Northrop wasn't just building a better jet for that time. They were aiming for a future fight, almost invisible, incredibly fast, a hunter. That's a good way to put it. A hunter for a fight that hadn't quite arrived yet. How did they pull that off? The invisibility, the sustained speed back then. Well, its unique shape was absolutely key. It looked almost alien, didn't it? It really did. Sharp, diamond-shaped wings. And instead of normal tails, it had these all-moving V-tail surfaces, rudder vaders, they called them. Right. These weren't just for control. They were meticulously blended with the fuselage using area ruling, all designed to minimize its radar signature from every angle. Not just head-on. That's a big difference. Huge. But maybe the most brilliant part, often overlooked, was managing the heat signature the engine exhaust, buried deep inside. Hot gases went through S-shaped ducts, then out through these troughs lined with special tiles, stuff derived from the space shuttle. Seriously? Space shuttle tech? Yep. 
It drastically cut the infrared signature, made it incredibly hard to spot, especially from below or behind. It was a low observability masterpiece. That sounds genuinely revolutionary. And the performance, the numbers backed it up. Oh, yeah. The YF-23, especially with the GE YF-120 engine, hit Mach 1.72 in Super Cruise. Significantly faster than the YF-22's Mach 1.58. Plus, it had longer range, a really critical asset. Okay, so hold on. Faster Super Cruise, better all aspects stealth, longer range, mm -hmm. designed for this future BVR combat. Why on earth did it lose the competition to the Lockheed YF-22? This is where... For so many people, the story just doesn't add up, right? Exactly. April 23, 1991, the Air Force announces the YF-22 wins, a decision debated hotly ever since. Many still believe the YF-23 was technologically superior, especially for the future fight. So what really happened? Was it just performance or... Or something else entirely, politics, doctrine. Well, that's the critical question. You have to look at the prevailing air combat doctrine back then, early 90s. It was still heavily influenced by Vietnam dogfighting lessons. So within visual range combat, WVR and extreme maneuverability, highly valued. And the YF-22 delivered on that. Big time. It had those two-dimensional crust vectoring nozzles. It could pull off amazing high angle of attack maneuvers, looked incredible in a tight turn, perfect for a classic dogfight. Whereas the YF-23. By design, it sacrificed that immediate showy thrust vectoring. It traded it for better all aspect stealth, and that sustained high speed. To many decision makers at the time, that seemed, well, too radical. Too much of a leap from what they knew, from the established dogfighting culture. So it wasn't just the numbers on paper. It was about perception, about showing capabilities that fit the current mindset. Precisely. The Lockheed team understood this perfectly. They put on a visual spectacular, high AOA passes showing incredible agility, even live missile launches from the internal bays. Quite a statement back then. Very dramatic. Very. <laughs> Northrop's approach, more conservative, data-driven, Validated the BVR performance, sure, but it just lacked that same visceral punch for the generals watching. The YF-22 looked better because it resonated with the Air Force's deeply ingrained dogfighting culture. It appealed to that ace mentality. But surely there was more to it. These massive defense contracts, <gasps> industrial politics must have played a part. Risk. Oh, absolutely. You can't separate the tech from the politics and perceived risk. Northrop, at that exact moment, was under immense pressure. Congress the Pentagon, they were looking hard at the B-2 Spirit stealth bomber program. Huge cost overruns, significant delays. Right, the B-2 was groundbreaking, but incredibly expensive and complex. Exactly. Lockheed, meanwhile, had its legendary skunk works, a reputation for delivering advanced stuff, often on time, maybe closer to budget. They just seemed like the safer bet. So it wasn't just about the planes, it was about the companies building them the perceived risk. It was definitely a factor. Choosing the contractor was as important as choosing the aircraft design. Lockheed felt more reliable at that moment. So it really sounds like the aircraft, arguably designed for the next war, got sidelined by the paradigms of the last war, mixed with some very current political and industrial pressures. A strategic blunder, many argue in hindsight. Yes, but now, decades later, the world seems to have caught up to the YF-23's original vision. So how has the strategic picture changed so dramatically? What makes those once-rejected capabilities not just nice to have, but absolutely critical now? Well, that's where things get really serious. We're about to explore the terrifying new threats, forcing the Navy, in particular, to rethink everything, and why this seemingly old design might just be their only hope. Stay tuned for that. Right. Fast forward to today. The strategic landscape, utterly transformed. The main threat isn't just other fighters anymore. It's these incredibly sophisticated anti-accessoria denial networks, A2AD. Layered defense is designed to keep U.S. forces, especially carriers, way out. Precisely. And connecting this to the bigger picture, for the U.S. Navy, this threat is sharpest, most pressing in the Indo-Pacific. China has invested massively in carrier killer weapons. Things like the DF-21D anti-ship ballistic missile, advanced hypersonic glide vehicles. Scary stuff. Extremely. Together, these create a huge overlapping threat bubble, hundreds, maybe even thousands of miles off their coast. This is what people call the tyranny of distance, and it directly threatens the core mission, the very relevance of U.S. aircraft carriers. These platforms have been the centerpiece of power projection for decades. And our current carrier planes, like the F-35C, you mentioned their range, about 730 nautical miles combat radius. Roughly. Yeah. That's a massive problem if the enemy can target your carrier from way beyond that, isn't it? 
It's nothing short of an existential crisis for carrier aviation. Commanders face an impossible choice. Either sail your multi-billion dollar carrier strike group into that weapon zone, extreme, unacceptable risk to the ship and thousands of sailors, or stay safe outside the bubble. But then your air wing, also costing billions, becomes strategically irrelevant. Its planes just can't reach the targets that matter. A rock in a hard place. Exactly. The Navy's FAXX program. It's designed specifically to solve this problem. It's not just about a slightly better fighter. It's about fundamentally restoring the carrier air wing's offensive reach, its survivability, its ability to actually do something in these high threat zones. Okay, so given that tyranny of distance and the A280 threat, mm -hmm. what's the Navy demanding for this FAXX? What are the absolute must-haves for a 6th gen naval fighter? Well, number one, Paramount is a significant range increase. We're talking at least 25% over the F-35C. Minimum combat radius needs to be way over 837 nautical miles, probably closer to 1,000. That's a big jump. Huge. It also absolutely needs advanced all-aspect stealth and super crews. Got to penetrate those defenses, get to the target without getting caught. But maybe the most profound shift conceptually is the move to a system of systems approach. Meaning? The FAX won't operate alone. It'll be the quarterback for a team of uncrewed aircraft, collaborative combat aircraft, CCAs. Think drones acting as forward scouts carrying extra weapons, maybe even decoys, yeah. all managed by the FAXX pilot from a safer distance. So the pilot becomes less top gun stick and rudder, more mission commander. Exactly. Orchestrating this networked force. It's a complete redefinition of the role. Okay. This sounds truly radical, really next gen stuff, huge technological hurdles, I imagine. But here's the kicker. How does this all loop back to the why of Cummy 3? Why is a design from the 90s suddenly looking like the perfect fit for these super futuristic needs? Ah, now we get to the really interesting part. Prepare yourself, because the specific design choices in this modern take on the YF-23 are incredibly clever. Yeah. And they reveal a strategy, frankly a shocking one, that could change naval aviation procurement, maybe even the balance of power in the Pacific. It's quite the twist. So, okay, here's where the story takes that almost unbelievable turn. Just a few weeks ago, August 2025, Northrop Grumman quietly updates its website a conceptual rendering pops up, their FAXX proposal. Mm -hmm. And once people noticed, absolute shockwaves, aviation, defense communities, buzzing. Why? Yeah. Because it unmistakably showed the design DNA of the YF-23. It's undeniable when you see it. The lineage is crystal clear, that sharp chiseled nose, the distinct chine line blending wing and fuselage, the big bubble canopy, all direct descendants of the original YF-23. You can see it immediately. You can. And the overall shape strongly suggests that characteristic diamond wing, those V-tail rudder vaders, the whole configuration optimized for all aspects, stealth and high-speed, long-range flight, plus that deep, substantial fuselage. It just screams internal fuel capacity, massive weapons bays, exactly what you need for that long-range Navy strike mission. It's like seeing a ghost. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a very powerful, purposeful one. Exactly. But it's not just a dusty blueprint dragged out, right? It's evolved. What are the key updates, the changes that make it a 21st century solution? Oh, absolutely. It's not a carbon copy. The most significant change, the one that really tells the story, is the engineer intakes. Okay. The original YF-23 had them underneath, this new FAXX concept. They're moved up top, yeah. shoulder position, just behind the cockpit. Why is that so significant? It's a huge deal for stealth especially against ground-based radar, putting them on top shields, the reflective engine faces from radar looking up. It also helps mask the heat signature from below. It's a clear design choice, prioritizing all aspects stealth, high altitude, high speed performance over close-in dogfighting agility. It basically validates the original YF-23 philosophy, but applies it even more strongly in today's context. And I remember reading the rendering showed heavy-duty twin-wheeled nose gear. A subtle detail, but critical, confirms its design for carrier landings, no question. So this whole derivative design strategy, mm. using an old proven blueprint, it sounds risky, maybe, but you're saying it's actually a calculated, almost disruptive move. Highly calculated, very disruptive. What makes it so powerful now? in today's defense world. Yeah. And how does it challenge what we're hearing out of Washington? Well, that gets into the industrial and political game. We're about to uncover that intricate gambit, the industrial chess move that could finally secure the YF-23's extraordinary future. This is where it gets really interesting. It's not just nostalgia, that's for sure. This yeah. is a strategic maneuver. A big one. So why revisit an old design? The number one advantage. 
massively lower technical risk. The YF-23's basic aerodynamics, its stealth characteristics, its performance, they're largely known quantities. Right. It actually flew. Exactly. It's not just theory. It's backed by extensive wind tunnel tests, simulations, and 65.2 hours of actual flight data from the original ATF prototypes. Starting from that advanced baseline, instead of a completely blank sheet of paper, it can dramatically shorten development times, reduce those costly, unforeseen problems that always seem to plague new programs. Which is huge, given the Navy needs a Super Hornet replacement soon, in the 2030s. Time and money are critical. Absolutely essential. And this strategy, it directly pushes back against what the White House and Pentagon have been saying recently. About the industrial base concerns. Precisely. They've publicly stated worries that the defense sector can't handle two simultaneous 6th Gen fighter programs, the Air Force's NGAD, often called the F-47, and the Navy's FAXX, too much strain. So Northrop's move is basically saying... They're making a powerful counter-argument. Look, our FAXX is based on a proven design. It's lower risk. It won't demand nearly the same resources, talent, manufacturing, budget as starting completely from scratch. It's clever industrial politics. They're tapping into that whole YF-23 legend, the strategic blunder narrative, to build support. The message is compelling. Fix a past mistake, save money and time, and get a superior aircraft faster. A very strong argument. So let's assume this works. The YF-23-derived FAXX becomes reality. What does that do geopolitically? Especially in the Indo-Pacific, how does it change the actual game on the ground, or rather, in the air and sea? Well, looking at the bigger picture, the impact would be immense, truly transformative. It would fundamentally rewrite naval aviation doctrine. The carrier strike group wouldn't have to push and close anymore. It becomes a true standoff strike platform. Projecting power from much further away. Exactly. Deep into heavily defended areas, but from a safe distance. The FAXX itself becomes this specialized penetrator, doing ISR intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and enabling strikes. It would direct those waves of CCA drones, manage standoff munitions, all while the carrier stays hundreds of miles back, out of harm's way from the most dangerous threats. Wow. So that restores the carrier's offensive punch. Makes it a credible threat again to those deep inland targets in, say, mainland China, command centers, missile sites. That's the idea. It forces a potential adversary, like China, to completely rethink their defenses, reallocate massive resources to counter this new long-range stealthy threat. It directly challenges their own 6th gen fighter developments, too. So this is why you said it changes everything. Exactly. It's potentially reversing a 30-year-old decision. Mm -hmm. It challenges current budget priorities. It aims to restore the carrier's relevance. It vindicates that BVR-focused doctrine. And it provides a powerful deterrent specifically tailored to the biggest challenge of the 21st century. It's an incredible story. An aircraft truly ahead of its time, finally arriving when it's needed most. A remarkable testament to that original vision. But. And there's always a but, isn't there? Even with all these advantages, the path forward isn't guaranteed. No, it's definitely not. The same political fights, the same budget battles that doomed its ancestor, they're still very much a reality. So the ultimate question hangs there. What happens if this groundbreaking comeback stalls? If it faces the same fate, what would that mean for global security, for the balance of power? That indeed is something profound for you to mull over. You've been listening to J&J's Military Report, where we analyze the latest in military strategy, global defense, and advanced weaponry. We'll catch you next time.